We've been talking about decisions and the season of decisions and other kinds of seasons as well. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So this morning we're going to look at a story in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, of course uh, the day of Pentecost. But what happened after, right after that, right after the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and the others in the upper room and they started to witness into everyone's language and Peter, of course, stood up and gave a tremendous sermon. And we're going to talk about the season of decision this morning. And the, the seasons that we go through, we have to make decisions. We have to know, uh, we have to uh, make determine the course of our life, or perhaps the very future of our life, if we make the proper decision or the improper decision. And how are we going to make the right one, the one that God wants us to make? So in Acts chapter 2, let's look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Peter just preached a very powerful sermon after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon him. He stood up, he preached to the crowds, and the crowd said, We are pricked in our hearts. We are convicted in our hearts. What do we do now? And then he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of your sins. So that was a decision that they had to make. We, are, we have been challenged in our hearts. We realize that there's something lacking in our life. We need to do something. What do we do? Peter said, well, here's what you should do, what you need to do. But they still had to make the decision whether or not to follow Peter's advice and to humble themselves before God and to repent of their sins and then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about the season, season of decision, specifically about the big decisions in our lives and the time when when God is dealing with us and the Lord has made need known to us that we need to decide to go His way. Because whenever there's a big decision facing you, it may be a, a decision about uh, where you're, what you're going to study in school or what you're going to do after school or who you're going to date, who you're going to marry, what church you're going to attend, uh, whether or not you're going to have children. If you have children, how you're going to raise the children. And a lot of big decisions. What kind of job, uh, what kind of career will you pursue? Lots of big decisions. Decisions about what church to join. Maybe a spiritual decision in your life. Maybe God has challenged you to uh, take up a ministry of some sort, whether as a lay minister or as an ordained minister, but you have that decision. God doesn't force himself on everybody. People often bring up the, the uh, story of Paul on the way to Damascus where the light uh, shined down and blinded Paul, and, and uh, God said, why are you persecuting me? And, and Paul, of course, uh, ultimately went uh, on and became one of the great leaders of the early church, but he still had the decision. He could have said no. Even though God did hit him pretty hard with that spiritual hammer at the time, uh, he didn't force Paul to do anything Paul didn't want to do. But Paul was a very devout man. And he always wanted, always believed that Paul wanted to do the right thing. He just didn't know what the right thing was until he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He thought he was doing the right thing by upholding the law of Moses, which before Christ would have been the right thing to do. But he didn't understand the grace, the dispensation and the age of grace that was coming that Jesus had fulfilled the law. But once he understood that Jesus had come, he had fulfilled the law as no man could, not even Paul. Then he understood that there was a measure of grace involved, and that's when he again said, I still want to do the right thing, but now I know the right thing is to witness for Jesus Christ. But he still had the decision. He still could have said no. We all have that decision to make in our lives. It began when 3,000 people were saved after hearing the sermon that Peter preached. The apostles and the other believers had been meeting for 120 days in prayer. You know, a great move of God only happens after a great amount of prayer. That's why I continue to emphasize prayer in our personal lives, but prayer corporately in our church as well. And that's why I encourage people to come to the prayer circle on Sunday mornings at, at 10 o'clock because we want to see a great move of God in this church. It's not going to happen unless we come together in prayer and we pray together. And that's why it's important to understand the importance of prayer. And that's why we have Sunday school and, and Bible studies and things like that so we can all understand the Word of God and we can pray more intelligently, but we need to be in prayer. And after 120 days of prayer, the day of Pentecost came, and then there was a great move of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 people in one day became Christians after Peter preached one sermon. 
God was ready to begin a new work in the world, and it continues until this day. So that 120 days of prayer had ramifications 2,000 years and counting later, and here we are, as the Christian church was founded at that time. When people heard the message, notice their response in, in verse 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, What do we do now? This morning in Sunday school, we were talking about the man who had the demon-possessed boy. And he first went to the disciples. And the disciples uh, could not cast the demon out. And so finally he came to Jesus. And the man had just, just enough faith. And Jesus was able to use just that grain of mustard seed uh, faith. And he cast that deaf and dumb demon out of the boy. that had been thrown him into the fire, thrown him into the water ever since he was a small child. But Jesus cast him out. And then the disciples came to him afterwards privately because they were embarrassed. Because they had prayed and then nothing happened. They couldn't cast the demon out of the boy. Jesus, why couldn't we do it? He said, well, first of all, you have to have a, you can't be afraid. You have to have some faith, even a faith of a grain of mustard seed. But it doesn't, this particular one, this was a nasty demon. And it doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. So in other words, there are certain strongholds, satanic strongholds in the world that must can only be attacked and only can be approached and only can have victory through God through us through prayer and fasting. And that's why it's so important. So the first decision you might have to make this morning is, am I spending enough time in prayer? Am I spending enough time in quality prayer? Why isn't God moving much in my life? Or why isn't he moving much in my family? My first question would be, well, how much time are you spending in prayer with God? God wants you to have a holy communion with him, a communion of prayer each and every day, multiple times a day. But just coming to church and praying once or twice a, a week isn't going, to, isn't going to move much uh, in the spiritual realm. We have to have enough faith to know that prayer works. I think most people here would admit, if not everybody here, that prayer does work, then why don't we spend more time in prayer? Notice that what shall we do is an action word. Faith is an action. And the gospel requires action on our part. And God challenges us not only to hear the word, but to do something about it. So it's great to read the Bible, but just reading the Bible is only part of the equation. What are you going to do on the battle? Are you going to stand on the Word of God? Are you going to stand on His promises? Are you going to pray uh, as well, along with reading the Word of God? So what does it take to really be a Christian in the biblical sense? Well, some people have experienced emotional salvations. And I'm going to go through a short list here. and You probably can think of somebody in your family or in your mind that falls in each one of these categories. First, there's the emotional salvation. They hear a message. They get a tear in their eye. They get a lump in their throat. They have a funny feeling. And then maybe they'll make a quick decision, but it doesn't last. You know, they're caught up in the moment. You know, the pastor gave an impassioned plea. We had an altar call. People started streaming down. Think about the Billy Graham Crusades where you would see hundreds of people coming down the aisles. And I'm sure many of those were genuine conversions, but I'm also sure that many of those were just emotional. You know, uh, Billy gave an emotional sermon. They, were, they realized that they were all caught up and started to tear. Oh, I need to go down. And that was the last time maybe they even dark at the door of any kind of a church or a worship service at that point. But they got caught up in the emotion. And it was an emotional salvation. Then some people make ritualistic decisions. They grow up in a church, as many of us have done. When it come time, uh, comes time for them to be baptized, they're baptized. They go through the rituals of the church. They go to Sunday school, vacation Bible school. They memorize some verses. They do all the things ritualistic that they're supposed to do. And then they believe because of that they're Christians. Because they made a ritualistic decision. You know, the pastor said, I want everybody to repeat after me. Uh, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I, I come to you humbly, I come to you humbly to, to confess my sins, to confess my sins. And they do the, the, the prayer, with, uh, prayer where they repeat. But that's just a ritual to them. It doesn't really mean anything to them. It wasn't from the heart, it was just from the head. That's a ritualistic decision. Then there are some who make a religious decision. That is, they make a decision to join a church and become a member, but it's only in name only. And there's some places and some churches people join a particular church because that is the place to meet people that are important in the community. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a church out in Tulsa, a very uh, a big church, larger than the one even that we attended, and uh, it was where it was known as, quote, all the wealthy people in town attended this particular church, and it was a beautiful church. You can tell there were millions of dollars went into this particular building, and uh, they had the huge choir, and they had all the, the beautiful furniture and everything inside, and we visited a couple times, actually it was a Methodist church, visited a few times, and the pastor gave a nice message, I can't honestly say I was moved by it, but, uh, you, but you just knew that if you wanted to meet all the movers and shakers in the greater Tulsa area, that's where they all attended church, and I had the feeling, and this was confirmed by others, that 
Uh, not everybody there, they might have been members, but they weren't necessarily Christians or born again Christians. They were there because they wanted to see and be seen. And sometimes people will make a religious decision because it benefits them somehow. It's not because they want a personal relationship with God. They, they want to get some kind of benefit. I go to church because I might run into the mayor of the city. Uh, some of the mayors had attended that church. I might run into the CEO of one of the big companies of the city. You know, I'm looking for a job. Maybe I can just bump into, you know, the president of XYZ Corporation because they attend this particular church. So there may be religious and socioeconomic decisions uh, that people make to attend church on a particular Sunday morning. Some people make an intellectual decision. They weigh the facts. They say, all right, it makes sense that there is a God. It makes sense that things didn't happen by accident. There has to be a God behind it. So intellectually, they will accept the facts about Jesus Christ as presented by the Bible. But the Bible says that the devils believe as well. They know intellectually there's a God. God cast Lucifer out of heaven. So Lucifer, Satan knows there's a God. And he knows he's more powerful than him. But yet he does not proclaim him as Lord and Savior. So just intellectually knowing, deducing, for lack of any other uh, viable alternative that there is a God is not enough to get you into heaven, not enough to make you a born-again Christian. What if the Bible says that you have to have? The Bible says that you have to believe in your heart. You have to truly believe and want to proclaim Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, to save your soul, but as Lord, as your, as your supreme being, as the one you follow, as the one who who's, uh, dictates that you will uh, follow after, whose commands that you will follow. So you may have, for example, parents. You get a child who's in trouble. Maybe a child was in the swimming pool and they're, and they're in trouble and, and they're starting to drown and you jump in and you save the child. You are that child's savior at that time. But when the child, you pull them out and you dry them off and you say, I told you not to go into that pool without anybody around and so on and so forth. And they, they're, they're sorrowful and so forth and they promise never do that again and they promise to do whatever you tell them. Then you have become their Lord. You have become the one who has control over their life. So you've been their savior and the Lord in the physical sense. And that's what we have to remember about God, is He is our Savior. He offers us salvation from our sin, but He also needs to be our Lord, that we will follow after His commands and after His Word. And you want to know what His Word is and how it becomes more relevant in our life? It also goes back then to prayer, so that you can understand His Word for your life. Acts 2.37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. The question was not, what will somebody else do, but what should I do? about my relationship, if I have one, with God. We all have a relationship this morning looking around the church. As far as I know, everybody here this morning has a relationship with God. Some people have had a longer relationship than others. That's fine. Everybody had to start somewhere at some time. If you started as a young person, then you probably have some benefit in terms of spiritual maturity. At least you should, because you've had more opportunity, a longer opportunity to study the Word, to memorize verses, and to study the Bible, and to pray, and to read. But everybody here should have a relationship with God, but are you moving forward in that relationship? When you start to date somebody, you know, maybe it's love at first sight, or usually it's infatuation at first sight. You see somebody say, oh, they're cute, or oh, they're handsome. You want to get to know them a little bit more. So you introduce yourself, or they introduce themselves, or you have a, a mutual friend introduce you. And uh, the first couple of minutes, maybe things seem to go pleasant, but then maybe they say something that's a little odd, and kind of a little red flag, and say, hmm, I'm not sure about that, and you get to know them a little bit better, maybe there's some more red flags, say, oh, that's, I'm not sure, that, that may be something I can't go any further with, and before long you realize, well, you know what, they were handsome, they were cute, but not going to happen, there's going to be no relationship there whatsoever. And sometimes people, I think, are like that with God, they say, oh, God is a healer, he's a deliverer, he's great, and, oh, but they're, you know, I have to take up my cross daily and follow him, you mean there's some sacrifice on my part, I can't party like I used to, I can't do all the fun things that I used to do if I have to follow after God. Well, red flags on my part because you know me, I like to be a man of town, about town. I like to have uh, my fun and I don't want to be beholden to anybody but myself. And so they fall away from that relationship. On the other hand, there may be a relationship that hopefully has led to maybe a lifelong uh, commitment to marriage. And it started out, who knows, uh, again, a mutual friend, maybe a blind date, could be whatever. But you get to know each other, you can start to like each other, the more you learn, the more you like, and so on and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you're dating, you're steady, you're engaged, and then you're married. And it builds one step after the other, after the other, after the other. And our relationship with God should be that initial born-again experience, but then you want to really enter into that relationship. You want to grow, you want to mature, you want to become closer, even closer to God. 
And you do that by understanding His Word and through prayer and through the fellowship of the saints to be to, to have a, a better understanding of the nature of God and what He do, has done for you and what He continues to do for you and what He wants to do for you. John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. See, God through His Holy Spirit draws everybody on the face of the earth, but it's up to us to respond, to make that decision on whether or not I want to pursue this relationship with God in my life. Do I really want to pursue it or do I want to back off? And that's a decision that we all have to make. God's Spirit calls us and convicts us. But what are you doing about it? What have you done about it? If you have done something good about it, as in humbling yourself and accepting God as your Savior, then the decision is, how, do I, how deep do I want to go into this relationship? How much further can I go? How much further do I want to go? Do you want to be that seed that was sown on the good ground that, that sprouts the roots and then just goes up above the earth and then it yields a harvest? Or do you want to be like that seed that's just choked by the weeds and the cares of the world? Or do you want to be the seed that's on fallow ground that doesn't have a strong root system and eventually is dried up and, and blows away? 1 John 4.13 says, Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. So not, secondly, not only is there reproof of the Spirit, but there is repentance of sin. So we know that we dwell in Him because He has given us His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in you. Again, we were talking about uh, that a little bit more, uh, this morning in Sunday school, and that check sometimes that we get when we've done something wrong, we realize that we did something wrong, something slipped out or whatever, and immediately, ooh, I feel bad about that. I'm embarrassed about that. I said a word I shouldn't have said, or I insulted somebody. I was mean to somebody. I did something that I shouldn't have done, or I didn't do something I should have, and all of a sudden, I'm guilty. I feel guilt just raking through my body. And that's the Holy Spirit's voice saying, you did something wrong, and you should feel guilty. But what do you do about it? What's the decision that you make? You just try to ignore it and say, oh, you know, I, I don't care. I'm just going to go on. Or do you say, stop. I committed a sin. I did something I shouldn't have done. I didn't do something I should have done. I'm sorry, Father. Please forgive me. And I repent of my sin. That's a decision that you make at that time. And you know when you do that, by the way, how much better you feel? Yeah, just the, the whole the stress just leaves your body right away. And then it even feels better, although it's still a little embarrassing if you actually wronged somebody else to go to them and say, what I said to you was wrong. I apologize. I'm sorry for hurting your feelings or insulting you or whatever it is that you might have done. Uh, and... They may or may not accept the apology, but that's but you've done your part. Because you say, you know what, as a Christian, I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have said those things or whatever it might have been. And uh, I'm sorry. And hopefully they would forgive you. But, you know, what you've done is what God had called you to do. And that is uh, to grow in maturity, to act like the Christian that he has called you to be. In verse 38 there in Acts, and Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what does it really mean to repent? Well, the word repentance really means to change or to change direction. Uh, it's actually a military term. Uh, metaneo, it means to change a direction as though a person is marching in one direction in the army and the officer or the commander says, about face, you stop and you turn direction. You go in the opposite direction. That is the military term that we now call repentance. So if you're going down the path of life and you're going to, through the path of destruction, you're heading in your life of sin and you stop, and you repent. What it means is that you turn your life around spiritually, and now instead of heading towards the world, you're heading towards heaven. And instead of heading towards Satan, you're heading towards God. And that's what it is when we repent. Even as Christians, we did something wrong, heading down that wrong road, even if it was just one sin, but we repent, we turn around, and we say, you know what? I don't want to commit that sin ever again. I don't want to say those kinds of words or do those kinds of things. I repent of that sin. My intention Honest intention is to not commit that sin. Again, I repent of that sin. It's an about face. But if you're a Christian, you say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I went down to the altar and, you know, and I repeated the prayer after the pastor and so forth. And your life hasn't changed at all. Have you truly repented? No. Because true repentance means that you're making a life change. Your lifestyle is literally changing from what it used to be to what God wants it to be. And what you should want it to be is a life that pleases God. So when you truly repent, you actually become a different person who behaves differently. That's what repentance truly means. And it's a change of attitude. It's a change of attitude about sin. No longer do you seek sin, but you abhor sin. And try to stay away from sin. You try to be obedient to God. 
That's why the Bible says you should flee from temptation because temptation wants to draw you back into sin. Temptation, you know, if Satan can't steal your soul, he still wants to compromise your testimony. He wants to make you an ineffective Christian. He wants you to make, he wants to turn you into somebody who's just kind of, you know, going through the motions, carnal Christian, uh, not witnessing to anybody, not really uh, involved in any ministry. He just wants you to, be, if he can't drag you, your soul into hell, he certainly doesn't want you dragging anybody else's soul into heaven by witnessing to them. So it has to be a change of attitude on your part and say, not only am I going to not sin, I'm going to flee the temptation when it comes my way because believe it or not, I know what temptation looks like because I've been a sinner all my life and I've been yielding to the temptation all my life. But now, as a Christian, I can see clearly where Satan's trying to come and trip me up, but I'm going to go the opposite direction, like that repentance. I'm not even going to commit the sin in the first place. Forget about repenting. If you don't commit the sin in the first place, you don't have to repent. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We need to repent. Thirdly, repentance is a change of lords or bosses. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you can be baptized in any name. Baptism, the word baptism means to dunk. But you can be dunked in anybody's name. You can just do a cannonball in the pool and be dunked, but not be baptized. It's not about uh, jumping into the pool. It's, it's what are you doing? You're telling the world that my life has changed. I'm making a public confession, a testimony that I have repented. I've turned my life around. I have been saved. But not only is Jesus my Savior, I'm now going to make him my Lord. And then he will be my Lord and Savior because I'm going to follow him. He's now the boss of my life. First and foremost, I will follow and do whatever he asks me to do, whatever he commands me to do. He is my Lord and Savior. Many people do try to accept Jesus as Savior without accepting him, in, him as Lord, but the Bible teaches that repentance is a change of lords. If you're heading in one direction, down the wrong road, you're following a Lord, a God of some kind, maybe the God of this world, but in order to turn around, to repent, you have to turn around and you have to follow after a different God, the God of the universe. Every time, here's this is interesting, every one time that Jesus is called Savior, to save your sins, He's called Lord 11 times in the Bible. So salvation is obviously important, but once you've been saved, then 11 to 1 ratio, Lord of your life, Lord of your life, boss of your life, head of your life, the one who's in charge of your life, he is your Lord and should be your Lord and Savior. That is a decision you have to make. Not only am I saved, but I decide that I'm going to follow God, God's way and not my own way. God knows better than I do. You're all familiar with Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What do you say to, any of you who have been in the military, what do you say to your sergeant when he tells you to do something? Yes, sergeant. If it's a commanding officer, you say, yes, sir. You don't say, but you know what, I think I've got a better way to do that. Or, no, nah, I don't feel like doing that today. It's yes, sir, or no, sir. Yes, sergeant, no, sergeant. It's not, uh, yeah, I'll get around to it when I can. No. Jesus is Lord of your life. He should be the captain of your life, the general of your life, the five-star general of your life. He's the Lord of your life. If God says, do something in his word, then we should say, yes, God, I'll do it. Not because I'm forced or compelled to, but because I want to follow after God's word. I want to please him. I want to do... Uh, what's, uh, I, I want to be a blessing towards God and, and a blessing to the people around me because He is my Lord and Savior. Jesus is either Lord of all or He's not Lord of all. You just can't make Him Lord of part of your life. He has to be Lord of everything in your life. You have to completely surrender to Him. That's why we sing to Him, I surrender all. I don't surrender part. I don't surrender Sunday mornings. I don't surrender Wednesday nights. I surrender all. All to Him, my precious Savior, I surrender all to Jesus. Peter then said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He's not saying be baptized in order to get sins forgiven. There are some churches that, that have read this incorrectly, and they think that baptism is part of the salvation process, that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Now, you get saved in your heart. The baptism is a requirement. It's one of the two things that we are commanded as Christians to do, along with uh, celebrating the Lord's table and communion. But we are to be baptized, but you've already been saved, and now you're getting baptized and you're setting yourself apart from the world and you're telling the world that I am now uh, in a different camp. I'm in a different army. I'm in God's army and he is now my 
Lord. He is my five-star general, not the God of this world. As I said, baptized, the word baptized means to bury. Uh, it's a burial. You're, you're dying to your old self. You're burying your old man, your old flesh, and you're being resurrected as a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's the decision that you're making, that I'm going now a new creation. If you're a new creation, you should act new. You should look new. You should present yourself as somebody different than your old self. When, this is interesting. When the King James Bible was written, they came to this word baptizo, uh, which translated uh, baptized, but they had a problem because the Church of England, of which the King of England was a member, was the one who had commissioned this translation of the Scripture. So they came to this word, and it means to bury. Well, that's not the way the Church of England did their baptism. They sprinkled or poured in their church. They didn't put people under water because it wasn't their practice. So they were faced with a dilemma. They said, now if we translate this to bury, then it's going to show everybody that something's wrong with the way we're baptizing people. And it's not the way that we do it. So they just took the word out of Greek and transliterated it into English. Baptizo in the Greek, and they just transliterated it into the English baptize. So in other words, they didn't translate the word exactly. They transliterated letter for letter. But it still means to bury, and it means to plunge under. As we said, it's a symbolize, symbolization of your form, death to your formal sinful self and a resurrection of your new Christian life and mind. So that's why we prefer baptism by immersion. Uh, as a result. And remember Jesus, it said, you know, Jesus walked 70 miles from Nazareth to the Jordan River where John the Baptist was just so he could get baptized. That was a long trek back then, 70 miles. We whipped that off now in, the, in an hour in a car, but uh, it was, you know, a couple days journey. Jesus went down there just to get baptized by John the Baptist. Not because he repented of sin, by the way, but because he was the answer to sin and he came to show why he had come into the world. And his, uh, one of the priorities of his ministry to get things started was he wanted to show the world he was going to be baptized. And that's how important it was for him that he was entering a new phase of his life from his private self to his public self in ministry. Acts 2.46, And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. This is the church. This is a description of the church at the time. They didn't have the formal church buildings. They had the Jewish synagogue. Of course, there was a lot of pushback at that time. For these Christians now were now proclaiming Jesus Christ as Messiah, so they were no longer allowed in the temple. So where were they going to worship? They worshipped in houses, each other's house. They went from house to house. So you could say here, and they, the church, continuing daily with one accord and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So they felt it was important for you to join a church or to associate yourself with a body. Now, we have church membership here, and we have a card that you can fill out. We have the church, uh, you know, uh, the vows of church membership, which have been developed over time, hundreds of years, thousands of years. That's not required in the Bible, but it helps us, you know, keep track of people. And I think it helps people maybe have a little more of a sense of, of uh, belonging to a particular body of Christ. But there's no commandment that you have to sign the church membership card, that you have to be on the rolls. Uh, and in our particular church, really the only benefit is uh, when we come to our business meetings, because we are a, a, uh, a legal entity, a non-public corporation. So when you vote on who's the next uh, uh, elder, by the way, Joe and Barb were elected elders again for the next two years in our business meeting last week. So you still have Walt, Amanda, Joe, and Barb as your elders in this church. Um, but you get to vote as a member. You're a voting member of the church, and that has to do whether you're talking about the budget of the church or whether you're talking about who you're going to hire as the next pastor of this church because should the Lord tarry at some point in time, I'm going to go to heaven. And those younger people who are still here, you may need to hire a new pastor. And if you want a true say who your next pastor is, you're going to have to vote. You're going to probably bring in several candidates. They're going to preach messages. Uh, you're going to interview them personally. You're going to get, check the references. But at some point in time, you're going to have to vote as a church on who your next pastor is, and only the members of record will get the opportunity to actually cast a vote. That may be the most important vote that you would ever cast as a member of the church. So that would be the advantage of becoming a physical, a legal member of this particular church or any, or any church. But it's important for you to associate with a body. Even if you don't join the church to be a voting member, and I would encourage you all to do that, but in any case, you ought to join a church for fellowship, number one, as they did. And I'm going to give you three reasons to join a church or to associate with a fellowship of people in no particular order. For fellowship. The Bible says they fellowship together. It means they have common ground, fellowship does. 
They had common ground. Their common ground was they had all been saved in the same manner. And they were all part of the early church. And they all proclaimed Jesus Christ as the Messiah, which was a radical departure from anything that they knew when they were being brought up as, as good Jews. The Bible says we need to encourage one another, love one another, help one another, pray for one another. Associating yourself with this particular church body means you get to understand who has needs in the church. We have a prayer list that we do. That's why I really encourage people to come early. Please come early on Sunday mornings if you can't come for Sunday school. Come at 10 o'clock for the prayer circle and tell us what your prayer requests are so we can write them down. We have a list back there, but if you don't tell us what your prayer request is, God can, but we can't read minds. So the only way for us to really know what your prayer request is to come and tell us so we can write it down and then people all week can be praying for you. So prayer uh, together, fellowship together, loving one another, helping one another. Somebody may recognize and may uh, speak about a need that they have. And maybe somebody else in the church has something that that person can do to meet that need. And it may save you some money. You may have a need for something. You say, well, I'm going to have to go buy it because I, I don't have whatever the need might be. Somebody else in the church may say, you know what? I have the same thing you need and I'm not using it anymore. You can use mine. It may save you a few dollars, hundreds of dollars. Who knows what it is that, that they may have. But you've got to speak up and you've got to know what's going on within the church. You've got to know the people in the church. You've got to be friendly in the church. Sometimes that's a hard concept for some churches to understand, but hopefully our church is a friendly church. Number two, join the church for worship. The Bible says that they were praising God there in Acts. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So what is it, that thing that will inspire you, that will lift you up and bless you and strengthen you? It's worship. That's why we like to come together. We like to worship the Lord in song and in prayer and in fellowship. It's all about coming together to a house of worship, hence the name, so that we can worship God. We can take our focus off of whatever's going on in our own life this past week. You may have had struggles, you may have trials, you may have had tribulations, temptations. Put all that stuff aside, and at least for a little while here, we can just focus on worshiping God and thanking God for the blessings He did give us this week. Thank Him for allowing us to get to church this week. Because maybe by last Wednesday, it didn't look like we were getting to church this week because of whatever was going on in our lives. But thank God that we can just ignore for the, the, the most part, the, the mess of the world that's going on, and focus on God here. But don't just focus on God on Sunday morning. I would encourage you to worship every day. In your own privacy of your own home, find a way to worship every day. Work, reading the Bible and prayer is actually a form of worship as well. Listening to Christian music or singing along with Christian music is a form of worship as well. You don't have to worship corporately, but it does help you and encourage you to get on your own for the rest of the week. And number three, Join the church for discipleship. It means teaching. Discipleship means teaching. How are you going to teach yourself if you don't know what you need, don't know? You don't know what you don't know. You come to church and hopefully through the sermons you'll learn some things. Through Sunday school you'll learn some things. Through Bible uh, uh, study on Wednesday nights you learn some things. And it helps you become more mature in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Discipleship, teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. There were some things that they had to learn. There's some things we all have to learn. I'm still learning. I will continue to learn uh, as long as I'm alive and as long as I draw a breath. I do not know everything there is to know about God or the Bible. I'll be the first to admit that. But I'm learning every day, learning every year, learning more and more. As I prepare sermons, I've said this many times before, I learn stuff and I'm preparing sermons to bring you on Sunday mornings. Because I'll be reading, and I've read through the Bible multiple times from beginning to end in various ways, and chronologically and just beginning to end and so forth. But every time I do that, I learn something. But I go back to, for example, Acts chapter 2, our source text this morning, and I learn something that I've read. I don't know how many times I've read Acts chapter 2, but I always learn something new by going through it this time. You can learn something new every time if you open up your heart and mind, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. But you come to church, maybe get some direction in your learning of what the Word of God says. You can become a Christian in one decision, but to be a disciple of the Lord is a lifetime submission of your life to Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. He was your Savior one time when you got saved, but He's your Lord for the rest of your life. So let's not ignore that. Let's embrace that and continue to make Him Lord of our life each and every day and recommit ourselves to serving and following our Lord each and every single day. He's our Savior. He has been our Savior in the past. He has saved us. He only needs to save us once, but He continues to be our Lord today and tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. And we know that and we learn about what our Lord wants from us by reading the instruction manual. Amen. And by praying. Because sometimes He will actually just tell us directly 
It always will agree with the instruction manual, but he will also tell, often tell us exactly what I want you to do in this decision in life. Where do I want you to attend church? Well, as much as I wish it said in the Bible that everybody who gets saved in the Kennedy area should attend the Bible Evangelical Church. I wish that were, you know, there in Proverbs somewhere or something like that, but it doesn't. But the Bible says that to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, so you should attend a church. That's when you pray and ask the Holy Spirit, which church? There's some other, other good churches. I'll admit it. There's some other good churches in the area as well who preach the Bible. But some of you, hopefully most of you, if not all of you here this morning were called to this particular church on this particular Sunday. And those of you who joined the church as members, hopefully it was because the Holy Spirit said, I want you to join this particular church. Now, we've had people come for a while and move on to other churches. Sometimes that God has you do that as well. There have been people here who have come and attended for a while. This really wasn't the church for them, and they moved on. And that's fine as well. But the, and I've said this before as well, and some people raise an eyebrow and said, if, you're, if this is not the church that God has called you to come to, I don't want you coming here. I don't want you in this church if you're not supposed to be in this church because you're going to probably cause more problems than you are solutions. If you're in a place where you're not supposed to be, then you're, not, you're going to be miserable, and that miserableness will seep out. Whenever anybody's miserable, you don't just harbor that inside, even if you're spiritually miserable. So if you're not supposed to be here, then leave and go find the church that you're supposed to be in. On the other hand, my prayer also to God each week is that there's people out there who are supposed to be coming to this church, but they're resisting that. I pray that God will continue to burden them and bring them to church this next week. So I want the people who are supposed to be here to be here as well. So that's our prayer this morning. Those are the decisions, some of the decisions that you need to make in your life. Are you ready to make the decision that not only, now that I am a Christian, I will act like a Christian, I will follow and I will I let the Lord be my, I let the Jesus be my Lord as well as my Savior and I will follow after Him that He will be my Lord forevermore and I will act like He's my Lord. People will look at me and they'll say, His Lord is, or her Lord is, Jesus Christ Almighty. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we had made that first decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Most important decision we will ever make in our entire life. More important than, than what we do with our lives, with our careers, with who we spend our life with. Most important decision, and I pray that everyone here has made that decision, is who will be our Savior, Jesus Christ Almighty. If not, though, however, if there is actually somebody here this morning and you haven't made that decision yet, please make that decision right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you, drawing you to the kingdom of God, but you have to make the decision to humble yourself and say, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, Savior of my soul, and I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And then repent of all that sin, that old lifestyle, and I'll become part of the family of God. Then it's a matter of who are we going to follow? Are we going to act like it is? Are we going to truly act like Jesus is our Lord? as well as our Savior? Are we going to follow His commands? Are we going to follow His Word? Are we going to pray? Are we going to talk to Him? Are we going to let Him talk to us? And it's a daily thing that we need to engage in. We can't ignore it. We have to get involved. Otherwise, the cares of this world will become our Lord. And we'll, uh, we'll acquiesce to those types of things, those burdens, those trials, those tribulations. We get our mind off of God and our eyes off of God. And we get them on our circumstances. And they become our Lord because they rule our lives. We can't let circumstances rule our life. Only Jesus Christ Almighty. Thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.